this video we'll be starting on the chapter of meiosis. Now this chapter is found in both paper 1 and paper 2, so it is quite an important chapter to understand. And as long as you keep up with the work and you think of it logically, you won't have an issue with the work. But it can seem overwhelming at first, but don't worry. So let's see what you need to know. Now, the exam guidelines wants you to revise the structure of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Now, we did that in the previous chapter of DNA, the code of life. So the only thing that might be strange here is the centrosome. So let's look at that organelle. Now, the centrosome is only found in animal cells, and it's this organelle over here. Now, the centrosome is made up of two smaller structures known as the centrioles. So this is a centriole, and the one at the top uh, helping form that T-shape is another centriole. Now these are quite important as the centrioles will help form the spindle fibers that will attach to the chromosomes that will pull them to opposite poles. But we'll look at that a bit later on in the video. Now we know by now that chromosomes consist of DNA and proteins. And then that the number of chromosomes in a cell, this is something new, is characteristic of an organism. Now humans have 46 chromosomes. And that is characteristic of us. If it was anything more or less, you would have a different organism. So just looking at the right at this table that I've provided, this is just um, for interest sake that you can see what other organism chromosome mounts look like. You don't need to know this, but for example, a cat is 38, a dog is 78, a pig is 38. Now, it doesn't make them the same type of organism if they have the same amount of chromosomes. It's just that those chromosomes are characteristic of certain organisms. There's obviously different genes and whole lots of other stuff that will um, make a cat different to a pig. Then uh, chromosomes which are a single thread become double, so two chromatids are joined by a centromere during DNA replication. Now I've just got a little diagram here at the bottom just as revision. So if you remember from the previous chapter, a DNA molecule is in the shape of a double helix and when that unwinds it is in the shape of a ladder. Now, holding these two legs of the ladder together are weak hydrogen bonds in between the nitrogenous bases. So those uh, weak hydrogen bonds break, then exposing those nitrogenous bases so that they can then be uh, basically rejoined to form a duplicate ladder uh, by free-floating nucleotides in the nucleus. So then... For example, free-floating thymine will join with the exposed adenine base and so the ladder builds, builds itself up until you have two identical DNA molecules. So just looking at the, the general structure of a chromosome, so this is a chromosome over here, and this is actually a chromosome after DNA replication has taken place because these two legs, and they are attached by the centromere. So before DNA replication takes place, a chromosome is also represented by just one leg. Then after DNA replication, you will get that general um, two-legged chromosome structure known as sister chromatids, so they are exactly identical due to the process of DNA replication. Just looking at the internal structure of a chromosome, just so you know uh, what they look like. So DNA and proteins are what a chromosome is made up of. So the DNA is coiled up and around them are uh, proteins, histones, and then that is coiled within the chromosome itself. So basically, just before we move on, uh, just so you know how this happens, before DNA replication, remember, you've got the 
the, the chromatin network that is like a pool of spaghetti and then they condense and basically they coil up on themselves and then you get a chromosome that is formed. Then you also need to be able to differentiate between haploid and diploid cells in terms of chromosome number, the sex cells which are the gametes and the somatic cells known as body cells and then also sex chromosomes which are known as the gonosomes and then autosomes and then a revision of the process of mitosis. So let's get started with regards to haploid and diploid. Now haploid is also written as N and diploid can also be written as 2N. Now this is everything to do with the chromosome amount. So like I said, humans have got 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. So you'll get 23 chromosomes from your mom and 23 chromosomes from your dad. So in total you will then have 46. So that is characterized by 2N, so that would then be diploid and then 23 pairs would then be haploid because it, or 23 rather, not 23 pairs, but 23 would then be the half of that, so it would then be haploid. So haploid is just basically half of the chromosome amount and then diploid is then the full chromosome amount. Now these two diagrams on the left here both represent a karyotype. So a karyotype is basically a representation of the number, the shape and the arrangement of a full set of chromosomes in the nucleus of a somatic cell. So what is a somatic cell? We'll get to that a bit later on. But a somatic cell, if you look at the bottom, is a body cell and then gametes are sex cells. So in the somatic, in the body cells, your chromosomes, each cell will have a set of chromosomes. And this is represented by this. So they are usually um, arranged from big to small. And then in this karyotype, you will get autosomes and then you will get gonosomes, which are your sex chromosomes, the gonosomes. So this is for a haploid cell. So this you would either get from your mom or your dad. Now, we will do this in much more detail a bit later on when we get to reproduction, but a female is represented by two X chromosomes and a male is represented by XY chromosomes. So when reproduction occurs, um, only one of these two chromosomes from a male or a female will be passed on. So a female can only ever pass on X chromosomes and a male can either pass on X or Y chromosomes. So the father actually determines the gender of the child. So let's say reproduction occurs and this chromosome is passed on from the mother. So obviously the child will have an X chromosome, but then the father can either pass on depending on what um, sex cell uh, carries whichever of these. So let's say the father's sex cell carries this Y chromosome, then the child will be a boy if it's XY. Um, so let's say the mother passes on an X chromosome and then the father also passes on an X chromosome, then the child will be a female because of the two X chromosomes. So looking at this haploid cells, it's half. So there's only 23 chromosomes. Diploid would be 46, so there's a full set. So this would probably be the chromosomes that are passed on in the sex cells. And then that would be the, de uh, the, f the uh, chromosome that determines gender. So in humans, there are 22. So let me just get a different color. So 22 chrom, whoops. What's happening? Okay, can't seem to erase that. So let's try work over that. So in humans, 
there are 22 pairs of autosomes, normal chromosomes. And then there is one pair of gonosomes, the sex chromosomes, which is this one over here. So this is the one that determines sex, so the sex chromosome. So looking at the diploid, because I was talking about pairs, there are 22 pairs of autosomes and then one pair, well it is always the last one, the 23rd pair will be the sex chromosome, also known as the gonosome. And I apologize for the handwriting on this video. I'm having tr trouble with my tablet sensitivity, so it's doing all weird stuff like making little toddler scribbles all over the place. So I hope you understand that. Just looking at this, this would be, if something is diploid, um, this would then be representative of a full set of chromosomes. So when you look at this, one chromosome will be from the father and another chromosome will then be from the mother and so it carries on. One from the father, one from the mother and this is then a diploid set. Haploid would just be one parent's chromosomes going to be passed on. So looking at this um, following the human life cycle, in the ovaries of a female and in the testes of a male, we want meiosis to occur so that we can have half the chromosome amount because the male's testes are going to form a sperm cell and the female's ovaries are going to form egg cells and those two are going to fuse and if they fuse that means they are going to join their genetic material which is chromosomes in the end so if this egg cell has 46 chromosomes and this sperm cell has 46 chromosomes, guess what's going to happen if they join? There's going to be 92 chromosomes, which if you remember from earlier on, chromosomes, um, the number of chromosomes in a cell is a characteristic of an organism and humans have 46. So now, if we put 46 and 46 together, there's going to be 92, which is not going to be characteristic of a human. So we need those chromosomes in these sex cells to be half the amount. Why? Because if 23 combines with 23, then we get 46, which is characteristic of a human. So we need the process of meiosis, that is a halving process to occur, so that each of these cells only has 23 chromosomes, making them haploid. Then when fertilization occurs, those two haploid chromosomes create a diploid zygote, which is then 46 chromosomes, which is 100% correct. And then that thing can carry on and grow and finally become a human. And then that process just carries on. So... Don't worry too much about this. We'll look at this um, again when we get to reproduction. Now let's look at somatic cells and sex cells. So somatic cells are the normal body cells. They are diploid, which means they are 46. There's 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs, whereas haploid will be just 23 chromosomes. They're not in pairs, it's just 23 like we have here at the top. So somatic cells are produced through mitosis because our body cells constantly need to grow and repair. So this is done through the process of mitosis. And examples here are, for example, a liver cell or a stomach cell or a muscle cell. So if you've gone, hopefully not because most of you are still under, under age and it's not a good thing to do. But if you go on um, a pub crawling thing with your friends and you drink a few drinks too much, guess what? You're damaging your liver cells and they need to get repaired. And you want them to be repaired in exactly the same way that they were before. So that has to happen through mitosis. Now gametes on the other end are the sex cells. So an egg cell and a sperm cell. So this, these cells are produced through the process of meiosis and they are haploid.
Now, once again, looking at a human karyotype, you've got the gonosomes, which are the sex chromosomes. So, pair number 23. And then the autosomes are 1 through to 22. So, those are the autosomes. Remember, this is a diploid amount because there's two pairs of chromosomes, or there's a pair of chromosomes. So, one from the mom and one from the dad. Now, this human carrier type will show you um, either it's a female, XX, or it could be a male, XY. This is just a representation of what it would look like because X chromosomes um, will have the same size and shape, whereas XY, um, that's also how you determine if it's a male or female by looking at the carrier type. If it's a male, it will be XY. It will have a very big X chromosome and a much shorter Y chromosome. So a size difference will tell you there that it is a male. So it's just showing the two options that could occur in a human carrier type. Then just a quick recap of the process of mitosis, which you did in grade 10. So it is a type of cell division that results in two daughter cells, each having the same number and kind of chromosomes as the parent nucleus typical of ordinary tissue growth. So in the end, you're just going to have two daughter cells that are, that are an exact copy of the, original, um, of the original parent cell. So mitosis for growth and repair. Remember liver cells. So generally your body cells and also organisms that reproduce asexually will use the process of mitosis. And that is the end of this first video just getting into the chapter of meiosis.